CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There's a certain kind of real estate which is special and unique. It can be at once the best or the worst place of all to be. If you want to hide from the world, shut away everyone else, and have perfect solitude, it's the place for you. But if you love your fellow man and value human contact, as most of us do, this paradise can be the very worst kind of hell. The piece of real estate is an island. And this is the story of a very special island. While you've been sick, Captain, Neb and me have been over pretty near most of this island. And we ain't seen hiding a hair of any other human being. Yet someone or something left us the stores. You're not suggesting some supernatural influence hovers around this island, then. All I'm saying, Mr. Gideon, is what I see and what I know in my bones. Our mystery drama, The Mysterious Island, was based on the classic by Jules Verne and written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Earl Hammond and Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In March of 1865, the Union Army of General Grant had the town of Richmond, Virginia, sewed up in siege. And a curious situation developed. Within the town were many northern prisoners, Union officers and others, whose burning desire was to escape and rejoin the north. But while allowed certain liberties, the town was so strictly guarded that escape seemed impossible. However, just as their prisoners could not escape... The southern secessionists themselves were also trapped. That is how Forster's balloon came to be manufactured and inflated in the great square of Richmond waiting on north wind, which arrived on March 18th with a vengeance. What brings you out in such weather, Captain Harding? What else, Mr. Spillett? Escape? Whenever the weather is bad is the time. The worse it gets, the better our chances have you a new plan? I've been approached by someone with a new idea. Who? His name is Pencroft, a sea captain and a navigator. Well, <laughs> we can hardly hope to escape by sea, so we have little need of a navigator. Don't be too sure. Suppose we were to escape by air. By air? How? We're looking at the means right now. Foster's balloon. Are you mad? We're not aeronauts. I am an engineer. Pencroft is a sea captain. We have some qualifications. And what about me? You, Mr. Spillett, will have a front-page story for the New York Herald. And what a newspaper story for a war correspondent to write. As if I'm alive to put pen to paper. No, no, it's impossible. The craft is too well guarded. And besides, Jonathan Forster is scheduled to leave today. With five heavily armed men. The gondola is packed with $2,000 in gold, ammunition, and stores. But if Bancroft is right, he will delay his takeoff. Why? He reads this wind as the leading edge of a hurricane. Forster won't risk it. And you propose we should? It's a chance that may never come again. How many are we? Myself, yourself, Bancroft, and his son. How old? A boy, but full grown. We can't very well leave Pencroft behind. It was his idea, and he won't go without his son. Very well. When? Tonight, after dark, at 10 o'clock. And keep your fingers crossed that the wind does not die down before then. And so began an incredible adventure. As a writer, it naturally fell to me to keep the record of it. And weird and unbelievable as it may seem, I have tried to keep it faithful. The hurricane that Pencroft had forecast became a reality. And 
and when the soldiers guarding the balloon had run for cover. That was when we made our break. Captain Hardy, do you think we dare try to take off? It's our only chance. What do you say, Petrov? We have a need who's ready to set out alone. Do I know nothing of sailing a lighter than aircraft? With you along, Captain, hey, your knowledge of balloons... We're doubly ready. Well, Gideon, are you with us? Well, if you think I'm going to miss out on the best story of the war, you're crazy. I am with you. All right, now listen. Luckily, the wind's blown out the gas lamps, so we've got the dark as well as the mist to shield us. But we'll take no chances, since none of us are armed. We'll split up now and each sneak up to the balloon from a different side. We meet there in five minutes. We're ready to cast off. Where's the boy? He was supposed to come from the east. I'll have to go look for him. Give him a chance. In the meantime, all of you, help me get rid of the ballast bags. Yeah, well, I won't go without my boy. Here he comes now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you waiting. What happened to you? Hey, with Top, he must have broken his chain. Who's Top? My dog. I told him he couldn't come, but... Uh, what, are, what are they good for doing to him? Oh, he's roused the guard. Pencroft, grab the boy. I've got to go to him. I've Looks got like to go to him. Looks like he's coming us. Cast off the cable on your side, Gideon, while I get mine. The dog jumped aboard. Oh, top one. I'm not getting him. Get him overboard. It's too late for two feet off the ground already. Thank heaven we're rising fast enough to get away from their bullets. We've made it. We've escaped. We're on our way home. did any of us know how long it would be before we saw that again, if ever. No words could describe the terror of the next five days. The full rage of the hurricane swept us through the air, tossing and turning the gondola basket like, like a pendulum till all of us were airsick. By night, the captain could not dare risk a descent, and by day, a curtain of swirling fog shrouded the earth. For five days, we rode the whirlwind, surviving it, Lord only knows how, till at last, that morning, for the first time, the mist parted below us, and we saw... The sea. It's sea beneath us. Yes, and we're falling fast. What's that sound? There's a rent in the balloon. The gas is leaking out. What can we do, Captain? Get everything overboard. Lighten her as much as we can. <laughs> oh, what about this gold? Over with it. It's over $2,000. Oh, it might buy us our lives. Over. <laughs> the food, Captain. Everything, even the guns. It isn't doing any good. We're still falling. Land, Captain. Land. Top foot first. Land. Where? Where? Neb, you're right, boy. Off to starboard there. We'll never fetch it. We're almost in the sea now. Oh, we've got to lighten her more. There's nothing left to get rid of. Yes, there is. We'll cut away the gondola itself. Quick, all of you, climb up on the net around the balloon and cling to it. The wind's carrying us toward the island. But, but Top, he can't up, get up. you go with the others. Boy, I'll hand Top up to you. Here. I got him. I got him. Okay. Hurry, Captain. Hurry. We're almost on the way, Top. Just one more cable to splash. Oh, oh, what happened? We took a wave broadside. But look. Look, it bounced the balloon up into the air. We're going to make it to land. We're going to... No, no, Top. Top. What is it, Nab? The Captain, Dad. The Captain, he's gone. And Top went in after him. A wave struck the balloon and carried away Captain Harding and the dog. And the loss of their weight had been just enough to let the collapsing balloon rise and the wind to carry it towards the land. Now, just before we came to the shore, the balloon, half inflated, fell again to the sea. And with the wind driving it and us clinging to the mesh, we were rushed to the shore, battered by the surf, fighting our way to shore, exhausted and half dead. <laughs> Oh, easy, easy, lad. Easy. We'll, we'll find him. Oh, never, never in a sea like that. Any, any sign of him, Gideon? Uh, I didn't, I didn't have much hope. And I was too exhausted to go far. Uh, what happened to the balloon? As soon as, as soon as we cut ourselves free, the wind took it. It's gone, too. Oh, it's top. It's top. Here, boy. Here, boy. Come on, boy. Oh, top, you're alive. You made it. <laughs> God looks in good condition. Strange. Something stranger. His coat's near as dry as a bone. How could that be if he come out of the sea? Well, he didn't. He came along the beach and... Hush, boy, hush. Oh, 
Captain, that means the captain may have made it ashore, too. I, I don't see a sign of him. If only Top could tell us. Oh, but he is, Mr. Gideon. He is. Look. He's got my sleeve, and he's trying to pull me back the way he came. He's trying to take us to the captain. We followed the excited dog. He was leading us into the tropical jungle. Now, after fighting our way for nearly a mile, we came out of a clearing off which opened a cave. And in it, we found... It's the captain! Uh, down, Top, down. Well, I only hope he's still alive. Uh, captain, Captain, can you hear me? Neb, here, take my hat. Get some water from that stream. Yes, Father. How, how, how is he? Well, he's, he's unconscious. Oh, that's a bad gash in his head. But otherwise, he seems unhurt. How in the name of all that's holy could he have got out of that sea, cross all them rocks, and dragged himself here? Mm. Seems impossible. But we haven't time to worry about any mysteries now. We have to try to bring him to. As I worked over the captain, my mind was busy with many questions. Where were we? Was it an island or a continent? Did it have inhabitants or not? And how could a man with so, so serious a concussion, exhausted from a long swim, have possibly dragged himself across those jagged rocks without injury and found his way a mile deep into this tropical jungle to the safe haven of this cave? I can't answer your question, Gideon. When I hit the water, I was knocked half dizzy. I swam as long as I could, but the waves were terrific. The last thing I remember was thinking I'd had it and blacking out. You don't remember anything about getting to the beach or finding your way here? Well, not a blessed thing. And Top? Oh, I, I remember his swimming beside me when I blacked out. Right, but he could hardly have dragged you ashore. <laughs> hardly. Well, uh, you'd better rest. Gideon, where are we? Well, uh, that's what I've been hoping to ask you. I've been thinking about that since I regained consciousness. Now, traveling southeast from a starting point in Richmond at an average of 90 miles an hour ahead of the wind, my guess would be some 7,000 miles away and somewhere in the Pacific. 7,000 miles? Well, the distance is less important, perhaps, than the direction question is, where we are here, is it the South American continent, the Asian, the Australian, or is it an island? I can answer that. We seem to be marooned on a desert island. A desert island? Uh, how, how's the captain? Well, much better as you'll see, Neb. What luck? All kinds of luck. Unbelievable. Washed up on the shore, lashed to two barrels which kept it afloat, a, a, a great sea chest full of all sorts of tools and weapons and clothes. Maybe more important, two wooden crates. One full of tinned goods, the other ship staples. Coffee, flour, dried beef and the like. It's incredible. Washed ashore from some shipwreck? Well, maybe, only... Well, you tell them, Father. All I could say is... Them rope lashings hadn't been in the seawater long. Someone or something, we think, left those stores for us. And I know for sure I couldn't have saved myself. I had to have help. Divine or... Now, now just a minute. If anyone's saying that some supernatural influence hovers around the island... All I'm saying is what I see and what I know... mysterious island, with its unknown benefactor who seems to protect our castaways, is he real or imagined? And can he still protect them from all the dangers yet to come? If he exists, will they ever meet him face to face? I shall return shortly with Act Two. conceive of traveling 7,000 miles in an unguided balloon, of being swept from one hemisphere to the other? And yet, if you'll take out a map of the world and lay an ordinary ruler from Richmond, Virginia, 
to the southwest, the direction that a northeast wind would blow you, you'll see you could end up somewhere south of the Hawaiian Islands in the midst of a sea that in 1865 was still largely uncharted. If indeed some other presence invaded our island during the next month, we had no further evidence of it. We were all too busy with our various tasks and Captain Harding with regaining his strength to think much further about it. One morning, Neb and Pencroft set out to hunt, and I set about constructing some more earthenware pots on a wheel which the captain had designed. Good morning, Gideon. <sighs> morning, Captain. It's a beautiful day. Seems so to me. Thanks to you, Gideon. <laughs> I've done little. Without your leadership and knowledge, we'd all have been in a bad way. Now, this potter's wheel, for example. Without it, no dishes. The magnifying glass you made for me a watch crystal without it, no fire, oh, hundreds of other things. Well, I'd be a poor engineer if I had no knowledge of simple mechanics. Are the others gone? Uh, yes, yes, good half hour since. Then I'd be an even poorer leader if I didn't face hard facts. What do you mean? We must find a better place to stay. But, Captain, we have shelter, water. Oh, I know the insects are bad at Gideon. night. So far, we've been concerned with survival. We've managed that. Now we have to consider escape. Escape? To where? Another island, then another. Till at last, the mainland or civilization. But how? We must build a boat. And to do that, we must be near the sea where it can be launched. Tomorrow I start looking for our new home. Three weeks later... Captain Harding had found what we came to call Granite House, which became our permanent home. I will never forget the day he first led us to it. A great granite cliff suddenly reared straight up from the beach, a sheer wall facing the sea. To the side of it, we climbed a tortuous path, past a waterfall, till we came to a small plateau with a small lake cupped in it. Around the lake, we followed him to an opening in the granite wall. And then, through a continuously downward path till... Seems like we're on our way back down to the beach again, except inside. Exactly, Mr. Pencroft. Well, we must have come a couple of hundred feet through this narrow cave, Captain. Not much further. This is a fascinating formation. At one time, I believe the lake above and the sea itself were one. Filling these caverns. Oh, it won't come back and drown us now, will it? No, no chance. You'll see why in a moment. Ah. Now. Welcome to your new home. Why, it's huge. Ooh. And all those windows opening onto the sea. That's why the sea no longer boils up into the lake. It broke through the granite eventually. Oh, it must be 60 feet down to the beach. A little less. But if we lived here, we'd have to have all that climb up. And then hundreds of feet back down again. Not at all, Mr. Pencroft. We would build a stout door to protect our rear. Rope ladders from our windows to come and go, which could be drawn up if need be. Use the waterfall for power to help our machines and build our boat ready to be launched in the river mouth down below. Well, I, I understand, Captain Harding, but do we need all that protection? Who knows? Are we not all sure there is some other presence on our island? We moved in, and we made it home, and we started to build our boat, the Bonaventure. Looking back over my diaries, it is hard to believe the time that passed almost unnoticed, but even harder to believe the amount of work that was done. On one of his exploring expeditions, Captain Harding had discovered the tattered remains of the balloon trapped in the treetops. These had been brought back to make sail. And at last, the great day of launching had happened, and we sailed within the lagoon, finding the Bonaventure handled very well. It was just at dusk, as we were returning to our mooring, that a strange thing happened. Help, Neb, come about. What is it, Pencroft? Don, if I know, there was an eddy there, like there might be a rock. But I... Oh, watch out to come about. We have the boom. Tremor, Ned. Aye, aye, sir. No, no, hold a minute. Let her fall away. Now what, Ben? Right there, Captain, where I saw the water break like an eddy. See it? There, a, a bottle floating. We came about, 
circling again. And sure enough, there was a bottle bobbing in the water. Penn sent Neb over the side for it. And in a few minutes, we hauled him in. Wet, but fighting. What have you got, lad? It's just like, just like Father said. A bottle. Give it here. Here you are, sir. Let's see if we can get this cork out. Yeah. There's a message inside, or at least a paper. Can you get it, Captain? What does it say? Just these words. Help. Please. Castaway. Tabor Island. 153 degrees west longitude. 37 degrees 11 minutes south latitude. Why? Well, that's not over 70 miles. Just over the horizon. We could make it in this craft easily as sailing downwind. But not all of us. It's near dusk. Head for the mooring. We'll set all our courses for tomorrow. I won't go into the discussion that night at any length. It's enough to say that since the boat could not handle more than three people, only two of us could go. At first, the captain and Pencroft seemed the logical pair, but Pencroft proved to be stubborn. He didn't want to be parted from Neb, and I had to agree that he was right. Everything we attempted was full of danger, and our boat was at best very frail. Obviously, it could be best handled by a seaman and his son. So, uneasily, we bid them goodbye the next morning. During the day, we kept busy, but with nightfall, the captain and I returned to worry and the helplessness of waiting. I don't like the weather. Yeah, it looks as if there's a squall on the way, but it, it should blow over long before they get back. Should I have let them go is the real question. <laughs> Another human being in trouble? What choice was there? If he's still there. Paper looked quite fresh. I don't think that bottle could have been long in the sea. Thinking back, that's what worries me. Well, nothing we can do but wait. With the fury of a demon, a tropical storm broke, and huge waves lashed at the shore below us. It was the night of the third day, and we had expected the Bonadventure back this night. Could we live in such a storm? Where have you been, Captain? I climbed down the rope ladder. The tides washed all the way to the cliff. I can't get to the bonfires to light them. Well, perhaps they haven't started back yet. I told them to spend no more than one day if they found no one to return. Maybe, maybe they saw the storm making up and delayed. Perhaps. Or perhaps the note in the bottle was some kind of a trick. The island may be inhabited. They may have been taken prisoner by some hostile tribe. Oh, I should never have let them. Oh, no, you, you can't blame yourself. But I do. Particularly for not being able to get to the signal fires. The dark... For a wind like this, they miss the island. They may be lost forever. They may... Look! Look, Kitty. The bonfires. They're lit. They're burning. Impossible. How could any man in this tide reach the point except by sea? And no mortal could live in such a sea. Look out beyond the bonfires. Can you see it winking on the sea? The riding light of the Bonaventure. And the fires will lead it straight to home. It was the bonfires that saved Pencroft and Ned. And who or what hand had lit them was a question lost the following morning in the excitement of their news. For they had found a castaway on Tabor Island. A new member had joined our society. He was tall, a mass of hair and beard, half clad in animal skins, filthy, more beast than man, and his arms were tightly bound behind his back. When we first reached the island, we thought there was no one there, although we did find a, an old broken down shack, but that looked as though nobody lived there anymore either. Then we found him running on all fours like an animal. When we tried to come nearer, he attacked us. And I don't think we could have handled him if I hadn't had a pistol to bring him to his senses. Oh, he gave me a whopper of a black eye, and we had to tie him up. He didn't want to come with us at first, and, well, he won't talk. You, you can't get a word out of him. Then you don't know his name or who he is or what he was doing there? Uh, that's enough. I'm... I'm British. What's your name? Well, that's as may be. Are you ashamed of it? Who are you, Governor? Captain Cyrus Harding. Military man, I... Union Army. Never heard of it. 
You American? I am. What are you doing on this here island? We're castaways, just like you. Captain Pencroft, sea captain that is, his son Neb, and Mr. Gideon Spillett of the New York Herald. Now you tell me, what were you doing on that island? Oh, now that's a long story. Captain Harding! Captain Harding, sir! Yes, Neb, what is it? I think you, I think you better bring your spyglass, sir. It looks like there's a, there's a ship on the horizon. A what? Here, here's the glass, Captain. Where's my... Oh, oh thank you, Pencroft. Where away, boy? Uh, east by northeast, sir. About 60 points. By Tophet, you're right, Neb. There is a sail. Can you make her, Captain? She's too low on the horizon yet, but ship it is. We are saved! We are saved! Well, I wouldn't be too sure on that yet, sir. Not if I was you. <laughs> In the midst of their excitement, all four of them turned to the stranger among them, their wild burst of hope and enthusiasm dampened, chilled as though they'd been doused in ice water by the ominous tone of his voice. What does he mean? What enemy could the approaching ship turn out to be? I'll return shortly with Act Three. left our four castaways gazing in surprise and dismay at the marooned man they had rescued from Tabor Island. But uh, he wasn't looking at them. With his arms still bound behind him, he had moved to one of the great windows in the rock of Granite House and was squinting out to sea with a seaman's eye, his gaze fixed in the direction of the faraway sail, just clearing the horizon. What do you mean you wouldn't be too sure of that ship? Till she comes a lot closer. It'll be an hour or two before she comes near enough to see what she is. It doesn't matter what she is. She's a ship, and it means a chance to get back off this island and home. Pencroft is right, Captain. I'll go light the bonfires. Plenty of time for that, my boy. She might share off if she sees no sign of life here. Uh, not much chance of that, I should think. She... She could mean rescue for you, for, And she could be bringing you what I'm afraid she brings me. She could be flying the black flag. The black flag? A jolly roger. A pirate ship. All right, everyone, let's calm down. Bancroft, take my glass and keep a close lookout on that sail. As for you, I think you'd better tell us this story of yours and make it fast. Uh, aye, aye, sir. It <laughs> is ten long years since I talked to any man. The words come slow and my throat is stiff, but I'll try. As you, as you may have guessed, my trade was the sea. But in 1855, I'd been on the beach in Australia. And in desperation to keep body and soul together, mixed up in various trades, <laughs> none of them quite legal, Oh, I palled about with another no good who in his cups more than once claimed to be the legal heir of Lord Glenarvan. You mean the millionaire, the shipping magnate? That's the same. I never paid him much heed. And one night in a barroom fight, he was knifed and killed by another Joey of mine. A Joey? An Australian word for friend, Neb. Go on. Uh, <laughs> about a year later, this big steam yacht put into Melbourne. And it's his lordship looking for his son. Well, between us, Bob Joyce and myself, we saw a real opportunity to make our pile and end up rich. Oh, the plan was simple. Lord Glenarvan's ship needed to take on some crew. Well, I was to say I knew where young Glenarvan might be found. And then, ship aboard with some men we had on our side. And enough of Bob Joyce's gold to buy enough others in the crew. For what purpose? The boy was dead. Where could you leave them? Just far enough to sea to take over the ship. Now, don't forget, a steam sail ship in those days in Australian waters. We'd have a freebooter which could own the seas. What's a freebooter? A pirate ship. And uh, I take it something went wrong with your plan. Yes, that's right. One of the crew I tried to buy went to the mate 
and threw him before Captain Gray. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And this sailor, fully proved guilty of the crime of fomenting mutiny, shall forthwith be hanged from the yard arm as an example. A moment, Captain Gray, may I speak to the condemned? Of course, Your Lordship. I can do little to save you, but... First, my son is dead. Uh, you can take the word of a dying man. Who killed him? Uh, that's not for me to say. Give me the name of the man so I can hunt him down and perhaps I can save your life. Well, why should I protect him now, whatever? The knife was in the back. His name is Bob Joyce. Very good. Bob Joyce. If I find this man, would you be witness against him? Well, that's an hard promise to make. Since within 15 minutes, I'll be dancing on the end of a yard arm. I could intercede. And have me set free? No one can promise that. On his ship by maritime law, the captain is in total command. Yes. I am sure my request could uh, save your life. You do that, my lord. And whenever you need me, just call on me. Oh, his lordship was as good as his word, as far as it went. Oh, I was saved from the gallows. But by the captain's orders, marooned on Tabor Island for the rest of my life. His lordship has never returned to call on you, as you suggested? Uh, no, sir. Why do you suppose that is? Well, until two years ago or thereabout, I had supposed because Bob Joyce was dead. And then... And then? A ship came to call at my island. I was delirious with joy. But some sixth sense warned me. I let the boat land, remaining hidden in a secret place. Saw the men who felt I had betrayed him, Bob Joyce, and heard him. He vowed he would search every island in this area until he found me either dead or exterminated. Well, why was he so violent against you? Because he felt I betrayed him. Condemned him to a life of piracy and fleeing the hangman. That's why you're afraid of this ship we see bearing down on us. That it may be his ship. Uh, yes, Captain. Because of it is, I'll give you my word for what it's worth. That he will destroy me and all the rest of us without a single regret. <laughs> I don't think there was one of us who wasn't deeply affected by the story Ayrton told, or not convinced of his honest repentance after the punishment he had suffered. But we had little time to dwell on that. For under a steady wind, the ship was upon us sooner than we expected. Less than a mile offshore, she came about, and after breaking out the Jolly Roger... Hold your fire. But she fired on us. The advantage of cannon, she's beyond our range. Uh, you're right, Captain. Don't answer her fire. It's what she's looking for. You mean to see if the island is inhabited? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Then if we don't answer, she won't anchor and beat off again? No, no, no. no. We won't be that lucky. <laughs> Put some boats ashore. Some boats? Aye, lad. There's 40 to 50 men aboard her. Far more than we can handle. Except one way. Which way is that? You'd have to trust me. To do what? I... I see a spit of land going out there. It can't be more than half a mile to the ship from there. It's coming on to nightfall. Free my arms. Take me out there and I'll guarantee to swim to the ship and set up the powder magazine and blow them all to hell where they belong. And if I fail, what have you lost? Under cover of darkness, Neb and I sneaked down with him to the point, leaving the captain and Pencroft to hold the fort. Neb and I were armed with guns to protect him if he had to make a run for it. At exactly midnight, he slipped into the water for the long swim, and Neb and I settled down to wait and pray for his safe return. In less than an hour, all hell broke loose across the water in the dark. We got him! We were discovered! Now that much is obvious. Can we help him to escape? Mostly by keeping quiet and praying. The trouble is, we never should have risked this. Oh, well, why? Because obviously now they know there's someone on the island. And it won't take long to discover how few of us there are. But, well, why should they bother us? I mean, maybe they'll just sail away. No, 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 I wouldn't count on it. They'll have to come to shore for water. <laughs> Explosions. 
explosion in the flare of it we could see the ship exploding literally into fragments which burst into the air in a spray and for a long time like a flaming rocket hovered till at last all the fragments came down to the sea and hissed out once again it was black we waited tensely and at last we heard the splashing of a swimmer coming near guns at ready we greeted mr Ayrton. hi hi lad oh give me a land here Oh, a long swim. And a worthy one. You got to their powder magazine. Uh, no, not I. They found me before I, I could get there. The pirates? Yes, uh, it was them, all right. We, we all had a fortunate escape. Oh, thanks to you. No, no, thanks to me, lad. But their powder magazine blew up. Not through my efforts. W- well, whose? Maybe. <laughs> the good God. But some other hand than mine. He's, he's passed out, Mr. Gideon. Yes. Exhaustion, I hope. Yeah, I'll take care of him. How is he? Not hurt. Just sheer exhaustion. Neb, tell you about the... Yes, and as you can see, now it's getting light. There's no trace of the ship, and... Well, what is it? Look, maybe that's our answer. To what? To the blowing up of the ship. The chest with the supplies. The bottle with the message. Everything that's been happening to us since we landed on this mysterious island. I looked, and rising from the sea was a sight I had never seen. A man, or was it a man, clothed in rubber with a great iron bubble on his head and two heavy tanks strapped to his back. Could it be human? Or was it something straight from the bowels of hell? Yes, gentlemen. I blew up your pirate ship. I am the answer to many strange things that have happened to you since you reached this island. Yes, I am. If you will, your benefactor. Now you must help me. But who are you, sir? My name, Captain Harding. It is and will never be other than Captain Nemo. Nemo? The famous, the famous Captain Nemo of the Nautilus? You and have 20,000 leagues under the sea, the same. But, but I thought, well, I, well, most people believe that you and your fabulous undersea craft were destroyed. A belief since I shunned the company of men. I was happy for the world to accept. For all these years, I have combed the underworld of the sea alone, in peace. And your crew? One by one, Captain Harding, the sea, the rigors of our life, have taken their toll. At last, three years ago, I was left alone. And the Nautilus, that fabulous undersea craft. I piloted it to its grave under this granite cave you live in. The well. You used to come up it in your diving apparatus and occupy this chamber for your own. Right. When you came to the island, I wanted to help. I did it the best I could. The chest of supplies and tools. The bonfires that were lighted to bring us home. My rescue from the sea and tops. The bottle with the message that Ayrton was marooned on Tabor's Island. But why? Why didn't you reveal yourself? My history is my flight from my fellow man. And now you choose to reveal yourself? Why? Because I am dying. I have made my last effort in your behalf by blowing up the pirate ship. Now I ask a return from you. What? Buried in a subterranean chamber below this granite house of yours lies the Nautilus. I am going to it to die. I ask you to make it my coffin. What is it you're asking? Restore my diving equipment to me. Let me descend through the well to my rest. Besides the explosive I used to destroy the pirate ship, I brought a chest, my gift to the living. Now let me go. Gift to the living? You may go, but where do we go from here? I can tell you where you must go. Must go? At least away from this island. The forces that trap the Nautilus are again burbling. There is an eruption coming which, in my belief, will bury this island in the sea. Mark my words. 
As soon as I descend to my burial chamber, you must set sail. In the Bonaventure? Well, it has barely room for three. Nevertheless, Mr. Spillett, you must load it to the gunnels. But any reasonable sea would swamp us. You must trust my belief that there will be no unreasonable sea. But where would we head for? Northeast by east, tracing the path you came. Only this time you travel the surface of the earth. Follow the trades, and you will reach the Hawaiian Islands. That, that's a wild venture. Not if you take my chart and the chest I leave you. Find your way home. And you? The sands of my life have run out. Once I am back where I have lived in isolation for years, I will be content with what is to come. But you... Leave fast. We left the island as we came, leaving every possession with weight behind. Or we sailed bravely away on the Bonaventure, wallowing in the sea. We had been forced there by the prophecy of Captain Nemo when the center of the island started to spout fire and later brimstone, and the whole earth had rolled in a terrifying warning that the island was about to blow up. island, what is it? That life is made to be lived, no matter how we find it, or how it may present itself to us, and that beyond us, there is a special being. Yes, if you want to believe in that, and if you do, you can believe that he can make anything possible, or much more important, that through him, you can make anything possible. If you just try hard enough, I'll be back shortly. A unique and fascinating man, Jules Verne. Over a century ago, he was opening vistas far beyond the vision of the ordinary man, charting unknown seas and revealing what lay beneath them ranging across unclimbed mountains, through virgin forests, reaching even deep into the heart of the earth to bring his readers the world of imagination. Where would the rest of us be if the dreamers and the visionaries didn't possess the keys to keep opening new doors to thank God for Jules Verne? Our cast included Earl Hammond, Leon Janney, Jackson Beck, and Roger Barron, the entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I suppose almost anything Mike does from here on in has to be on his own. Well, suppose he falls. We covered that eventuality, and you know what he said? What? Something that we can't argue with. Would he be any worse off if he did? Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. I know. But it's a terrible situation that we all have. You know what Mike's like. He doesn't think of himself, only us. Now, it would be just like him to be quixotic enough to think that his death would be better if it was quick and sudden. It might be better for him, Joan. No, no, no. We've got to hold on to the last minute. Hope against hope. Oh, Jack, why did you let him go up that mountain? What's going to happen to him now? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>